I just threw Victoria under the bus. Yes. Big way. Uh, you know, I love throwing people under the bus, especially when I do it by accident. You're really good at it. When I, when I do it by accident, because I don't feel guilty because I didn't do it on purpose. I need to get you to start understanding some of the social cues social around cues. you. Social cues. No, no, no. Anyway, our guest tonight is Victoria Sullivan, the Honorable Victoria Sullivan, who is running for mayor. And we have uh, Sir Josh of Solomon, who is a, what did you say, Irish what? Uh, French, Irish, French, French Irish. lesbian. Uh, okay, so. Okay, yeah. And I don't know why he said he admitted that to me tonight. <laughs> I was really embarrassed for him. Um, but anyway, before we start, before we start, uh, we're going to have a moment of silence because this is a, uh, you know, with all silliness aside, this is the uh, 18th anniversary of 9-11. And so just a moment of silence for those people who uh, passed away and the, and the uh, first responders who went in there and risked their lives, and many of them lost their lives uh, on that day. Lord, watch over them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I all those that are still suffering from oh, the yeah. effects of being there too yeah, yeah all, the, all the dust and stuff like that messed yeah. up a lot of people and uh yeah i, I still remember the day I, I don't know what you guys are doing i was at work at uh i was working at kirk motion products in hollis and somebody says hey check this out one of the guys in the in the uh, other department had a tv going all the time and because uh, he could do his job and watch tv it didn't matter and and I saw the video of the first plane hitting the. I said, "That's weird. I can't imagine how that would happen by accident." And then the second one hit, and it became very obvious very quickly that it was deliberate. You know. Yeah, I was actually. It was. I just remember it was a beautiful uh, fall day. The sun was out. The sky was so Crystal blue. Clear. Not a cloud in the sky. And um, I was outside. I was actually painting the railing outside, and my husband came home he had been actually working in boston and he came home and he said don't you know what's happening and i said no he said we're under attack like what do you what do you mean you're under attack i don't understand what you're saying and we went in and we turned on the tv and i think like everybody we just were glued to that tv for hours and hours and at some point like you just couldn't take it in anymore you know there was just so much and trying to just reconcile the fact that we were just attacked here in our country where we always felt safe right and we went for a ride up to the beach and we were in Markey's and I remember how quiet it was there were only a few other people in there and it was like nobody knew how to react everybody was in a state of shock and I think it lasted a few days and when it comes back up those feelings are still so raw and I for, it's hard to explain to our kids it, because it they is. didn't live it, but those emotions, I don't think they'll ever leave. Yeah, I, I, I was at work as well, and I received a phone call from my wife saying, hey, a plane just hit one of the towers. I was like, okay, well, you, it was the period of time where we thought it was an accident. Yeah. And um, Right, because at and first, then, everybody thought it was an accident, right, until work, that second plane I work plane in the technology hit. world, so, you know, we're on the Internet you know, for most of our work. Yeah. And then everything started to slow down and quit, and we couldn't get any information. And then we got another phone call, the second tower, and that was it. Okay, everybody go home. And uh, and like you said, you glued to it for, for hours. For me, it was days. And, and there came a point where I just could not take it in anymore, and I went for a drive. And again, streets were empty. Everybody, everything had shut down. Everything. The magnitude of the shutdown that took place <laughs> was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You know, the entire air traffic system in the country went down for six days. Was it yep. six or five? Um, but, you know, 4,000 commercial flights a day, never mind the private flights, private jets, private airplanes, uh, recreational airplanes. <laughs> everything was shut down completely. The magnitude of that is, is immense. You know what the first plane I saw was? You know, I live out where out in the out in the boondocks. The first plane, because because living out there, you hear planes going over mm -hmm. all the time. First plane I saw heard was an AWACS. It's like wow. Yeah. And, you're, and you're right, my my grandkids they weren't even born yet. They yeah. don't have any idea. I I was yeah. still in my twenties. I was still in you know what were, you might consider my formidable years, and I I spent a long time thinking about where's this gonna go. 
am I am I ready to to do what's necessary to you know I had a six month old child at the time um, you know I the the thoughts go through your head it was a it was a uh, it was a stopping moment for this country yep. and, and I try to explain it to the kids and they they see the footage but the they'll never understand the emotions of that day because you actually had to live through it to understand it yeah. and you carry it with you still. Um, but I, the the one thing, and I don't care what party you're from and I don't care about you know other years of his presidency, but on that day, George W. Bush was the best president we could have had at that time in that moment to handle that situation. Yeah. Uh, he brought the whole country together and that was a kind of unity that I haven't seen since then. I hope we find it again someday. I hope we don't need a church. tragedy. To bring a lot of it people back, went but to church. Giuliani did amazing. He did amazing. Yeah. Years later, I met Giuliani at the at the Republican convention here in, in New Hampshire, and uh, it was only a couple of years later. Um, but uh, he he made a few remarks about his tenure there, and uh, and one thing that struck me about him was he was real. Yeah. There was nothing about his emotion that was made up. And and we're talking three or four years later, and, yep. and so um, shaking his hand was was a, was an honor because of, of of the way that he handled it, the way that George mm -hmm. Bush handled it. Um, you know, we see a lot of. I that think the footage. way we handled it as a nation too, like we yeah. we mourned together, right? right? We we recovered together, and it felt like that for a lot of months after. It felt like we were still one unified country, and the the love of our country was abundant it was just right in, it's, in front it's a center. shame that you know those of us who have vowed never to forget aren't forgetting but there are some that are forgetting now yeah. you know and so we have these i don't want to like change the subject to a, a a different but you know you have a politician who says oh well, some people did something i you know that mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, let's not the go there. Let's, yeah, it is, but it's let's not so, go. There. But I think for but, some know. people, I know for me personally, that was that was an awakening for me. I think I was pretty blind to politics in our country up until that. I was living my life. I was young. I think I was, you know, I'm not going to quote the years. How's that? But I was still young. <laughs> um, and you know, we were married, and we didn't have children yet, and our lives were just about us. You know, sort of selfish at that age. And I think. I started to really wake up after that moment and say, okay, there's a lot more to this world that I am not seeing and not paying attention to. And that led me on the path to actually get into politics and start making making a, a difference and, and dedicating time that to that. That was my first term in the legislature. and I Did you run because of it or were you in there when? No, I was already in. I ran because I could see where this country was headed. headed yeah. And um, I'll, I'll tell you exactly why I ran. I ran because I believe in the Constitution and the Second Amendment. And I could see the complete and relentless attempts to erode the Second Amendment, which is the last defense against tyranny. Yeah. And I also knew as a Christian, I am not confident that if they come for my guns, that if a 22-year-old kid obeying orders in, in uniform comes to my door and said, we're coming for your guns. I am not confident I could shoot that person as a Christian. I can't see how, how I can remedy that. So I decided to run for office to try to stop it before it got to that because I don't know what I would do. I know what I should do, but I don't know that I could do it. And, and that's why I ran for office. And then when... Uh, 9-11 uh, happened and I, I remember calling the state house so we supposed to do anything and they said what are you gonna, gonna your state rep what are you gonna do I said I don't know it just seems like we should do something we ended up having a big prayer thing out in front of the state house and stuff like that it was pretty pretty wild pretty wild anyway yeah. Victoria Sullivan you're running for mayor I am I am. So I hate to switch gears this quickly, but I'll just introduce myself to folks if you don't mind, if, if people may not know who I am. I know who you Not are. that they don't regularly watch your show, everybody but just in wa case, Everybody watches the show. Just in case so they didn't watch it when I was here last, yes. although we had a great conversation. I am Victoria Sullivan. I served in the House of Representatives for two terms. I got to serve with Gary. Yeah. For all four years, I served in the House Education Committee. I was also an assistant majority leader under Gene Chandler. And uh, 
I am now running for mayor for the city of Manchester because I am unhappy with the direction the city has taken. I believe that I can bring the community together to find community-based solutions to make our city better and stronger and safer, and that is why I'm running. So you said you served on the education committee. Yeah. That kind of leads us to. Yeah, I saw on Facebook somebody uh, had asked about education. What I was, well, what my ideas that, were. But uh, if, do, do I remember seeing uh, uh, something about uh, uh, negotiations breaking down? Yes. And uh, uh, I think Rich Gerard is going to talk about that more on his show because he's been pretty much front and center on that. He's um, on that committee. So um, for folks that aren't following along, we had the MEA, the teachers contracts, and they've been under negotiation, I think, for 18 months now. And um, the bipartisan committee, negotiating committee, had come to an agreement. They brought it to the school board. They were in unanimous agreement, which if you watch our school board meetings, that in and of itself is a miracle because they rarely agree on anything, never mind unanimously. They brought it to the MEA and they rejected it. Um, they, there were supposed to be more meetings coming, but they decided not to attend the meetings, the MEA. This is my understanding, and Rich can call in, correct me if I'm wrong. The mayor had recently decided that she was going to put our brand new superintendent in the middle of this and throw him into the negotiations and put him on the committee and let him try to work it out. At the meeting the other night, he made it pretty clear that he did not want to take on that. He's got other responsibilities to do in this district, and that was not something he signed on for. So isn't that the role of the, of the mayor? Or, so or she is who, the, who the be, chairman of the school board, but right. she appointed a special committee. So it should be up to the special committee to do okay. the negotiations. Okay. So this was to circumvent the work that the committee had done, bipartisan committee, like I said, and they had been in lockstep the whole way, lockstep with the rest of the board. It's not them, it's the MEA won't come to the table anymore. Um, they actually want more than we can afford, more than what's in the budget for all the bargaining units. They pretty much want all of what's in there, and we have to use what's in there for all of the bargaining units, not just one. So um, she tried to get sort of hand over the power to the superintendent and put him in the middle of it. And luckily in a non in a bipartisan vote, the school board voted that down and they will be continuing with the negotiations. The superintendent needs to come in here and fix a lot of other really important things. And he shouldn't be thrown into the, the politics of all of this. Well, if he gets thrown into the politics, won't that kind of corrupt his ability to do his Th that's job? That's basically what he said. He said, I want to view everybody in a way that makes, you know, I like to see everybody in a light that everybody's in it for the right reasons, doing the right things for the kids. And I don't want to be in, pushed in the middle of something where people are coming in divided. And, and he's right. I mean, they have been unanimous in their decisions up until the mayor decided to, to try to sort of thwart their progress and go in a different direction. So what are, what are the, the, the problems b besides obviously the contract, which is a, an obvious problem, but what are the other problems you have in, in the school systems now that you plan on working on? So um, as a legislator, as you know, I had put in a, a bill for play-based kindergarten that passed, and that is now being implemented across the state. It's also being implemented um, in other states. I've had legislators reach out to me that want help implementing that law in their own states. Because when we brought in Common Core Standards, what we did was we took kindergarten and we made it seem like an upper grade, right? So they weren't playing, they weren't socializing, they weren't moving, they weren't exploring, they were sitting at a desk basically just doing their work. For what grade? Kindergarten. That's stupid. Right. Well, you voted on this bill. You helped me get it passed. I did? You did. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm good. So the first time I introduced it, it actually failed. And people told me I didn't understand kindergarten. Um, but I will say thanks to Adam Sexton putting me on close up to discuss it, we were able to change the conversation. And people started asking me questions about it instead of thinking that they already knew. Because my kids were two years apart in school. And the one year of kindergarten was very different than the others experiencing kindergarten. Right. They had the same teacher who was a wonderful teacher, beautiful person. I always say I want to be her when I grow up. I'm going to give a shout out to Mrs. Ruby. Um, <laughs> seriously, if every teacher was like her, honest to God, she is an amazing human being. Um, but the the restrictions that were placed on teachers because of the Common Core and the standards. So when Manchester went to all day, we had teachers that thought, okay, now that we have all day, we'll be able to put back in the playing and the socialization and the other things. It didn't happen. The rigors got, they were even more um, rigorous 
standards that were expected to be reached in kindergarten. They were expected to read, understand how to write sentences, do pre-algebra. <laughs> yeah, pre-algebra. And so in kindergarten. In kindergarten. So this bill actually gives them back the play. Our, my hope is that that trickles back down to preschool because I've met with preschool teachers that said they had to make preschool more rigorous to get the kids ready for kindergarten. Rigors in kindergarten and rigors in preschool should not be in the same sentence, right? No, no. And then we're hoping that this sort of goes up toward K through three as right. we go. Because we had teachers, when we had um, the presentation come forward, Dr. Kim Kimberly Nesmit, who has been helping to implement this across the state and train teachers. We actually got a grant to help train teachers in play-based kindergarten. Yeah. Um, when she presented here in Manchester, she had we had um, middle school teachers saying, we hope that this works as intended because we do not have middle school kids that can collaborate and work together because they have lost the foundation of that in elementary school. So I think that will help with the bullying, with some of the stresses that we see in the kids right now because we're going to let them be kids and let them learn in a way that's comfortable and natural to them. Kids are supposed to learn through play. Kindergarten, is its literal, me, literal meaning is a children's what? garden. What? I mean, if you really look throughout the animal kingdom, mm -hmm. that's how they learn everything, everything when they're little is playing. Yep. You know, and it's it's and if you make it fun, yeah, they're going to learn more because they get the physical and the mental and and experience. And they learn how to socialize with each other. The reason we've got so you hear a lot about emotional social social learning and Lisa Freeman. I know you gave a little bit of a hard time on Facebook today, but the Honorable Lisa Freeman, yes, who is, sits on the school board, has been asking how many emotional social. Um, programs do we have in our schools right, right now because everybody has a new program right social emotional learning everybody has it she said how many do we have going on are they working how are they structured no one can give her that answer well they're trying to put social emotional learning in because they removed it from the younger grades right the kids learn this stuff on the playground they learn how to get along with each other and for the teachers they're going to be able to assess kids by observation instead of sit down do a test Kindergartners, can you, the kindergarten sitting down to do a written test to be assessed. Can you imagine? So they'll be able to assess through observation. And it's not free play. Like there is some free play, but it's children <laughs> guided or teacher guided, and they're given different instructions to do things. So they do have outcomes that they have to achieve, but it's through play. Right. So that's for the younger grades. And yeah. then for the older grades, we need to have more variety in, in what they you know they want to achieve so we've got the spark academy that just started up in yeah. manchester yeah we have mst we have some great things going on at west dan laura shell over at spark is, mm -hmm. a, is a wicked great guy yep i'm hoping that works out really well for him we, well, we, we don't have a classical education in any of our high schools and we really should have a high school that offers a classical education but we really need to work on the structure of our structure of our schools we need to support the teachers when it comes to disciplining children because we've seen a lot of what happens in our schools and they're not someplace that you know kids feel safe often because of what happens inside the buildings and we need to support the teachers when they want to discipline the children take control of their classrooms and I've spoken with a lot of teachers who do not feel supported Right, yeah, because right. they get kids. Kids, I know that I, I talk to people that work at West, and I won't say their names because they get in trouble. But they said that you know some of the halls is like because there's gangs in the halls. Yeah. Okay, and the the uh, now this is there's a new guy in town, new sheriff in town, but the old one um, they used to call the upper floor where the uh, uh, administration met. They, they called it the Ivory Tower. That was their nickname for that place because they didn't come down and actually talk to anybody. They just stayed there. Yeah. And they got, like, top-level security to get up there, even talk to somebody. And I think that those are things we have to talk about, especially mm -hmm. the gangs and the drugs. And these are things that we need to shed a light on and find solutions for instead of pretending they don't I don't exist. understand why we don't have, because they have the a company I know was making the... Uh, uh, a device, geez, it's got to be 20, 30 years ago, that could detect, use smell to detect things. I don't understand why you don't know somebody has an opiate as soon as they walk into a school. Period. You know what I mean? It should be doable. 
I, I think it's doable, but I think, and, and that technology does exist. I don't know how you, expensive you it is, but yeah. Exactly. You can embed those things right into the door frame, and so as they walk through a door, it's, it's even it's hidden, right? I mean, it's, you know, uh, but we're talking about expense. So now we're talking about taxes and 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 it's a same it should budgets. that's i mean i don't so know how like i don't know how expensive it is but i know that people go into valley street and they get opium why the heck is that because if one of our legislators talking to one of the legislators at the uh uh governor had a uh picnic yesterday i went I to the picnic huh i saw i saw uh, the yeah. pictures yeah and um i was talking to one of the other legislators who was talking about putting um, people away that were caught on the streets with opium so that they could at least be clean for a year and i says they're not even clean in prison. No, Why? and they're back out the next day. Yeah. Well, that's, of, that's kind of the other side of, of how much how much security can we put in place? How much money can we throw at it at that security? Right. Because we know that even in a place um, that is supposed to be one hundred percent secure, um, uh, they will find a way. Right. And at the same the, time, the, being a liberty the, person, how much do you want to put your kids it, it, under scrutiny it, it, right. as, because they're going to school? Right. Do we want to have drug dogs there every morning to greet them when they come in? Or do we want to start having conversations yeah. that are real, that educate parents as to what to look for with their children and start working towards education that way? I think that's how we solve it. I mean, I think this, the scariest thing my son said to me, because he's going into high school now and there will be parties, and I had said to him, what can we say to you? that keeps you from ever trying it. Because it's not like, you know, when we were teenagers all those many moons ago and you knew, you know, some kids that smoked pot and that was it. They're even lacing pot with fentanyl. They're doing anything they can to get these kids addicted and get, keep them addicted for their lives, as short as they may be if they're addicted. It, it, it really um, needs to come down to that. It needs to come down to parents uh, speaking with their children early on, and it, and it needs to come down to uh, uh, having that open conversation yeah. as early as possible. But what and he that, said and that to me was, there's nothing you can say because every kid thinks they're invincible. They always think yeah, it's going to be someone else. A, exactly. And that was the scariest thing that I think he could say. He's to telling the truth. Very, he was telling, a very he was enlightening the thing truth. for him to say as well. Yeah, so yeah. For, it, is, it is true because that, that's, that's why they draft them. Because they think they're invincible. Yeah. You know, it's a really, it's a really horrible age because they're willing to try anything and they don't, not scared of anything. So we have to, I think, so we have to go back to how do we remove the temptation or the desire or the pressure to do it, right? Because like you said, it's not like when we were kids where if they, if somebody experimented with something, it wasn't going to kill them. Right. They might be stupid and get in trouble. And, they, and they're getting all kinds of street drugs. Like, they're getting Ritalin off the street that's laced with fentanyl and killing kids. So they, I mean, there's, there's just nothing safe. And they have these things called Skittles parties. So if you have yep. leftover drugs in your cabinet, no matter what it is, they don't even know what it is. They take it, they go to a party, they throw it in a bowl. And then these kids will just pick whatever it is and take it and see what happens. I mean, it could be heart medication. It could be anything. And they just, they take it. So the only way to, uh, you know, keep your drugs locked up and away from the kids. Don't let them know what you have. Cause you don't know, it could be anybody's kid. This this opioid thing is not for the low income or the poor kids or the kids that don't have a dad at home. It is hitting every family and yep. it is far reaching. And I do not know a family in Manchester that's not affected in some way, whether that's they're taking in other people's children to care for because the parents are no longer around because of opioids or they're dealing with it within their own you, family. You walk, you walk, drive through the streets of Manchester and you will see so many grandparents with a grandchild in them. hand. Yep. They're raising they're the grandbabies. Because they're raising their, their grandchildren. Yeah. I was driving my boys to school the other morning and I had to stop because somebody was on something and they walked right in front of my car and I almost hit her and she was completely out of her mind. And this was our morning commute. This is what they saw on the way to school. I know. Right? This isn't acceptable and it can't be our new normal. We need to come together as a community, talk about these really hard things that we need to talk about. Stop looking at the government to try to figure this out because they are not going to fix this. It's actually gotten worse the more that we've what tried to fix it through the government. Speaking of that, what are you what are you going to as mayor going to try to do to uh, curb the uh people doing drugs on the streets and everything else? Yeah. I mean, so there are, there are people out there that know how to do this work. 
And the problem is we keep looking for the money to come in and help us. Everyone's about the money. When we get that money from the state or from the federal government, you know, we don't get to use it the way that we need to use it. No, they tell you So the you first thing that it. has to happen is we start talking to the czar out in D.C. and say, listen, yeah, that money is great, but we need to use it for mental health and we need to use it for beds and we need to use it the way that we need to use it to fix our, our state or right. our city. Right. Because that is not what happens. Like, we just got this whole thing. It was in the news about the millions we're getting. And if you read it, the millions is to go to a study we don't need to study why people are dying people are dying because they're taking opioids right, right? so what we need to do it's <clears throat> actually more fentanyl than anything now people are dying from heroin they're dying from fentanyl so what we need to do is work with our faith-based organizations that are out there that want to do the work work with the organizations that already know how to do this bring everybody together talk about what's working get rid of what isn't working, and really focus on the solutions that are making progress in our city. You know what one thing they should do? What? They should start treating drug dealers like damn terrorists. That's, that's where I was I, going. I'm so there, absolutely... There, there has to be a, a law enforcement component to this. Understand there's a lot of people that need help and that, you know, we get the faith-based organizations involved, but we do need to have a an enforcement, a law enforcement element to this, whether it be enforcing existing laws or creating new, more stringent laws that, uh, so that become a deterrent. Because of a bill that Dan Feltis put in that sponsored um, last year for a bail reform bill that went way too far, and I think we can agree there are places where we need bail reform, but he put in one that went way too far it has, re it has resulted in a catch and release program across the state. It's really hurt Manchester. For dr drug dealers or for drug anybody. users? No, anybody. No, the, the they get arrested and they're was, back out on the yeah, street like was, in 12 it was hours. basically a revolving yeah. door. Um, and so we, what we did was you guys, um, I worked, I made sure, I spoke with Dick Hinch and I spoke with John Burt who was on criminal justice. And yeah. I said, I know that you've got a bill coming in to repeal some of this. Can you make sure it goes through? Let me know if I need to testify. Let me know what's going on. They said, no, no, it's, it's going to pass. It's going to be all right. I met with the governor and said, you know, when this gets to your desk, will you sign it? Yep. He said, I've supported it from the beginning. I'm absolutely going to sign it. It went into law on June 25th part of it the second part that actually has so right now it's all up to the judges the second part will be they reinstate the board that will decide whether these people get to, to be out on personal recognizance or not right and that goes into effect in november so watching to see if those two components actually fix the problem is going to be what we we need to watch so you might need to shuffle something in there for legislation to help us out if it doesn't but currently that's why we have a catch and release program right now so it doesn't matter what law you make if they are homeless or if they say they're addicted or there's there was a whole list of criteria that they could just say that they were and they would put be put back out without paying a dime and being put um to their own personal recognizance right, without right. having to report to anybody else the yeah well, well you only have the, to the end of next week to introduce legislation so if you think of something, you better, better think. Maybe we'll work on it. Put it in. If this works and we don't need it, you can always kill it, right? Well, i got to know what it, it is to time. put in. I'll talk to you. Okay. But, um, no, I'm, I'm actually going one step further than that. Okay. I think if you get caught with, uh, I don't know what the quantity is, um, X number of grams of fentanyl, you're a dealer, and you should be sent to Guantanamo Bay. You should be yeah. sent to Guantanamo <coughs> Bay, right, until you start releasing names. I mean, it, it should be so severe. Uh, now I'll tell you the worst thing that we did was that the Narcan bill. And it's because we, we put in the Narcan bill and there were no repercussions. There was no treatment attached to it, nothing. So people receive Narcan and then they're, they're just on their own and they're narcan again in 12 hours and then 12 hours after that and the police and the emts are saying they're seeing the same people over and over again well every time you you are unconscious and you're blue you're losing oxygen to your brain so they bring you back with narcan you are not the same person you were before that incident so five six times later these people are not no longer capable of functioning in normal society well i i they, we need to we need to actually change that bill so that they get treatment i talked to my uh, local PD, because that's what I was right on the same lines, mm -hmm. because I, I have two classes of people. You got the dealers, yep, that I think should be waterboarded. Some uh, well, people well, deal well, to well, support their own habit, though, yeah, and well, that's good. where it gets. That's excellent. So they should be waterboarded while they're coming off of drugs. 
Okay, that's one group of people. You got the addict, um, and I went to my local uh, uh, chief, and I said, to me, if you're an addict, if you're shooting yourself up with heroin, that is no different than somebody who's sitting there playing Russian roulette. There is no way somebody, if you went into somebody's house and they're over there going, click, oh, that didn't work, spin it again, you would put them away mm -hmm. because they, they are mm -hmm. no longer functionally in charge of their life right. because so they, they are... So if they are Narcan, they should be treated they as should, if they just tried to commit suicide correct. and get Absolutely. Help. Absolutely, and they I should be on I suicide agree. watch, and but uh, and and that's or, or and, we, and our governor in the budget that he put forward had money for more beds for mental health treatment in the Concord Hospital for twenty more beds, and that was killed by the Democrats, right? Right. So we don't have that money to help these people because mental health and opioid addiction are they go hand in hand, and that's also going hand in hand with our homeless problem, right? So we need to, to invest in mental health treatment. We, yeah. And it was in his budget, and then when the Democrats came out with their budget, not only was it a business killing budget. Um, a tax raising budget, but they reduce the amount of beds that we would have for treatment well, that, That's for the problem. I want to introduce that legislation, but practically, if I introduce it, the practical problem with where do you find a place to put all these people becomes para becomes. But all. there is money in there, and that's when we have to push back to the federal dollars coming in and saying, like, we don't want money for a study. We want that money so that we can it, we can use it for brick and mortar to put in more beds and use it the way our city needs to use it. Right. You can do that with grants. You can they can offer you a grant and you say thanks. Let me work on this and get it back to you. They can say yes or no, but you have to at least try to make it the money that it's it's our tax dollars. Right. So when it comes back to us for our use, we need to use it in the way that's most efficient for our city. Yeah, I, I totally agree because you're you're right. The city knows what to do with the money, but then again, you have places like Baltimore. They send billion dollars and they. Whisked away. So uh, it's tough. And we have, you know, and aside from that, the other side of the homeless crisis that we have, aside from people that are addicted that are living out there, and God knows we have a, a lot of them, um, we have people that are now living in tents because they're in between apartments. They can't afford to get into an apartment in this city. So the average rent right here right now is $1,300 a month. Right. So if you want to get into an apartment, first and last is $2,600. That's, right. a, that's what I put down for my first for our house. Right. It was FHA loan. I think you had to put down like three percent or something. Yeah, I put forty one hundred down for my first house. That's a house. And then so I've met people out there that are living in tents that are seriously working. They're working. They're using a gym to get clean to go to work. They come home from work. They live in the tent. I met a lady. She was coming back from Bible study one Saturday morning and. She was going back into her tent, and she said she had an apartment, but she was earning the money to give the guy first and last month rent. So when we override the tax cap, which we just did, this mayor could have vetoed and did not, we're increasing the property taxes. When we increase the property taxes, they directly affect these people because rents go up. And do not think for a minute that those property owners are going to absorb that cost. No, of course They're not. They're going to pass it down to the people that are renting. And so their rents go up. So then we've got people that live on fixed incomes, like our elderly, that cannot make up that money. Right. And people that are barely getting by now that can't make up that money. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, I don't know how much. What is what is $15 an hour? How much? Do you, if you made... If somebody's making it's $15 like, dollars an hour. I know that. I figured that oh. out. <laughs> it's, uh, I think $15 four an hour. Four is four is four, <laughs> six, six hundred. It's only like 30 grand a year. So that's half your, that's half your salary. Yeah. And excluding the taxes taken out. Yeah. Excluding the fact that you might have to feed your children. Exactly. Or buy a car or register your car yeah, or insure your car. Yeah, and there was just a thing in the paper about this woman. She's getting evicted. She'd been living there for 10 years in her apartment, but it was bought by somebody. They're going to renovate it so they can get more money out, out of it because the rents are high here. And um, the person that runs the rental company said people are – so this goes to that whole trained thing. Um, people, young people, are living here because although our rents are high here, it's still less than in Massachusetts. Yep. They're working in Massachusetts, 
they're living here and they're driving down to Massachusetts to work. So when people think that that train is going to bring people up here to work, they're going to be have, it's going to be the same thing. It's just going to be easier for people to leave here and go to work in Boston because right. they make more in Boston. Right, right. Yeah. Well, how how do we reconcile that? I I, I don't think that that uh, rents are going to come down. I think I think the the best we could hope for is to stop the the increases from right. Continuing. So if we prioritize spending and we protect the tax gap and we do those things to keep the taxpayer in mind while we still meet the needs of the city, which is absolutely okay. doable, um, we we help with that situation. But we also need to you know really look to some of the properties that we do have here. And if you walk, if you drive through the city, we've got some great architecture here that is being completely misused. Like they're just run down and nasty. So when people come in and they want to build, instead of investing so much money into building new things, well, we've got green space that that's drying up. Like we don't have much green space anymore. If they could invest in these properties, maybe the city could go do a tax incentive to, to help them renovate these neighborhoods. So we've got affordable housing. We're, we're renovating neighborhoods so that we bring up the value in those neighborhoods, reduce the crime, the whole broken window theory, right? If it looks nice and you want to keep it nice, people have pride in their in their properties. And I think that's one of the solutions that we should look into. I think Frank Ginta did that when he was mayor on the west side. Right. They offered an incentive yeah. to start, you know, working on the west side. Yeah, I think I think you have to do something like that or yeah. or yeah. you have to incentivize. You can't you can't you can't stick the government fingers into it like, you know, rate control or or, or, no. or anything like that. You have to incentivize the private sector to to want to do that. Yeah, I and, mean, and there's other. I mean, Bedford was supposed to have some houses. affordable housing, right? And they they fought against it. Like, we can't be the only people that offer services in the state, right? It just can't be. So there's got to be incentive programs for them to from the state that that help them to to want to have some of the services that we have here. I've invented a new system that you might want to. I can't look wait into. for this. Okay. Hot air balloons is a new solution. Is that how we're going to get people back and forth to Boston? No. We just have hot air balloons. They just balloons live in them? Live in them. Can you fit a kitchen in there? Yeah. Oh. So bathrooms? Well, you do You do ultralight bathrooms and, well, you'd have a hose. So, <laughs> so you have these hot air balloons just floating all over the city. <laughs> what do you think? <coughs> I think it's an <laughs> interesting <laughs> thing to live inside <laughs> your brain, Gary. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> well, it could be like a tether hose combination, really. Electrical wires, everything, right in that one hose, mm -hmm. and they just kind of float. Well, we would hope there are good, strong the floating, sealants around those hoses. Floating though. city of Yeah, you yeah. probably definitely, you would definitely want some good, yeah. You probably want to take them down when there's a wicked bad storm or something, come down for... Okay. It's very. That's a very interesting Nobody theory. I'll have to take that. it under advice. Nobody has thought of that. That's not true. You have thought of it. Okay. Well, I'm, okay. Yeah. See, that's, <laughs> that's a good point. See, because, you know. Well, you, gotta, well, you know what? We'll have to put it out there. We'll, we'll put it out on Facebook. Right. And we'll ask people. Okay. We'll ask people. Right, if you think that Gary's idea is a good one to have a hot air balloon, the people just. So we elevate the whole city. Right. We have elevated housing. Elevated housing. That sounds much better than right? hot air balloons. That's how we market it. It's yeah, elevated, elevated housing. housing. People live in hot air balloons. Apparently, they discard by a water hose. waste through a tube that could be above your house. Yeah. So. You never know. Yeah. So. Maybe you could rent maybe, out. Maybe they maybe could, we could do that with grandparents. You could rent out your the right. back of your house to so that that hose can go into your toilet and they pay you rent or, for or using your disposal. Right, or exactly. Your, your yeah. Oh, and I think we got right, something here. Gary, it's time for you to write that grant. I want to see how you word it. <laughs> you elevated very housing. Creative. Elevated, elevated housing. housing sounds almost we just believable. Solved all the problems, and then yes, it does. The drug dealers. Right get elevated housing whether they like it or not no you just cut the cord <laughs> oh there's dealing drugs in that balloon <laughs> bye bye yeah. last scene <clears throat> at last scene over greenland i feel there may be some <laughs> oh 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 i gotta tell you issues associated with your idea no 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 <laughs> We may have some if they're drug dealers, some pushback, a little bit of pushback. If they're drug dealers, oh God, how long do we have left on this? Show? No, no, it's, it's okay. This is going to ruin your chances. But oh my God. so, so the for the second term, my second okay. second term, mm -hmm. I uh, oh yeah, it was second term because I had to run in Goffstown too, 
And I had this guy, John Wallace, that I was running with. And I says, we got to do Wait, something. Wait, your second term, you had to run in Goffstown. Did you go for Floterio in your second term? No, no, but they changed the district, so it oh, was okay. Goffstown aware. That outnumber us two to one, so it was not easy. So um, my friend John Wallace was running for state rep. He says, we got to do something different, completely different. And we ended up with uh, helium balloons holding up. This is where it all began. This is where it all began. Helium balloons holding our, my si our signs up. Like I made brackets and stuff out of plastic to lock them together. And, and that was one. And, and where there's a bunch of helium balloons with four signs, you know, two and two, ho holding al those aloft. And then he went down to Gosstown and he decided to go do it easier in Gosstown. Were they tethered, or were you, like, floating tethered, them yeah, around the tethered. town? Okay. They're tethered, theoretically. So, <laughs> theoretically? So <laughs> he, does, he does another one down in, in, in <sighs> Gosstown, and he attaches my sign, and then he's attaching, you know, like, putting a hole in it and attaching his sign below that. Mm -hmm. he, he lost his grip. <laughs> I don't know where my sign. I just I expected right before you the election, by the or FAA, right, FAA over right there? after the election, you know, Orca, the Orca wheel chokes to death on Representative right? Gary Harper's sign. <laughs> yeah, you're not getting out of that one. There's evidence there. Some right hunter found you. it later on. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> anyway, so elevated. We we're talking about elevated housing. But don't you wonder where the balloons all go? No, no. I think they go to Germany. Why? Why did you picture? <laughs> because. Why did I ask that question? I, I, you know, I don't you'll, know. You'll, you'll learn. You'll learn. <laughs> Sometimes you just well, got to let it go. All right. Like the balloon. You got to let it go. Yeah. Let it go. <clears throat> anyway. So what other cool ideas so do you, you want to do? you and I are going to work on legislation that fixes this problem with this catch and release program, right? Catch and release. Yeah. We got to figure. Well, I, I think I'll in, I'd l uh, work with you on introducing legislation to start treating these kids that are. Uh, if you have to use Narcan on somebody, they need to have treatment. They need to have treatment. You cannot. I will help you with that. Okay. I had put in a bill before that would have allowed people, um, communities outside of Manchester, like anybody, could have a sort of safe station, right? But do it the way that they wanted to do it, the way that best fit their community because some towns don't have a 24-hour police station right right they have volunteer police or whatever but you might have a community center that people are willing to man or a church that people are willing to have hours for to help people out and they could have these places with you know the drug drop boxes there that they work out with the state police that they can come pick them up for them but places where people can go when they have that moment of clarity where they think I lived through the night and I don't want to do this again and they want help in that moment yeah and I introduced that legislation three times I got killed three times um, but I think I, I know from being a legislator that having the conversation can change people's hearts and minds like it did with the kindergarten bill right so the more we talk about it and introduce these things and I think Manchester may now be willing to testify on behalf of something like that because the safe station is taking in so well, many people from outside I had of our a, I had a Narcan bill years ago but the hospitals killed it the hospital association killed it which kind of there is a fear that if people well let me just tell you what the bill okay. was the bill was that if somebody received narcan that you had to go to the hospital to be at least for observation and that if they got to the hospital that person had to be offered mm -hmm. a meeting with a uh a recovery coach yeah somebody that could tell them hey yes i've been here i've done what you've done this is what we can do to help you. But they, uh, hospitals killed it. Why? Did they not have the coaches? Did they? An they an didn't want to. Administrative. They, they didn't want to deal with it. They didn't want to deal with, with the uh, uh, probably heroin addicts even going in there, much less, you know, uh, trying to. Because you can get Narcan over the counter now, right? So those people, there's nothing we're going to be able to do about well, getting well, help the to cops those right but, now. If they, but if they're helped by EMTs or the police, then they should receive some kind of treatment and help. Well, yeah, because that's what the the, the uh, firefighters and, and cops tell me right now, is they tr they treat somebody while all of a sudden they're awake. They get up and walk away. They get up and walk away, and they have no no. What I saw somebody because um, I did a ride along with the police, and yeah. when I was out there, we saw somebody that needed to be narcan and when he woke up, he was angry, like very violently angry, and he did not want to be woken up. So, 
you know, what do you do with somebody like that? They told me that he had, had been, he received Narcan the night before, and he was probably going to receive Narcan the night after. So you just com continue to Narcan this person until what? Until their faculties are completely gone, they can't function anymore in society. Right. Like, that's somebody that needs help. They need treatment. Yep. I, I, I would venture to guess chain that the, the hospital group gangs. Was, was leery of, of this bill, <laughs> thinking that this bill may, may, uh, provide an influx of patients that they don't already see that's probably i think part of it is people think volume. that if there's a, a treatment attached to it or a reporting attached to it some people will not want narcan and they will choose to die a a absolutely y you know and i think that is one of the fears but i think in the hospital has to take down names right. and, and all of that other but uh, I, I think when the bill first came around and we voted on it i don't think anyone envisioned someone being narcaned eight times like i yes i did would, i didn't i, I did i i thought when it came because i remember it was uh amanda bolton that was yeah. the one who was pushing yeah. it i said i think we're enabling people and i never liked the fact that there wasn't treatment attached to it i think i right. may have even voted against it i'm not sure because there wasn't treatment I, everything i've done up there i pushed for treatment and but if someone's getting like two, I think most people would think if you were to the point where you were for all intents and purposes dead and they had to bring you back, that would be enough for you to say, you know what? I don't want to do that again. No. I need treatment. No, but it it's is not it the way is that the it is. Opposite. Not it is. Work that way. It is the opposite. If I, if, if you, you can t ask the police this. No, no, I, they believe, find, I think in the beginning that's what people if thought. If they yeah. find that somebody on the, the west side was over near X and they died from a heroin overdose, the drug addicts will go there looking for that high. Mm -hmm. Because the perfect high is just before the abyss. That is the perfect high. And, and that's, that's why the, that yeah. fellow was angry. Mm -hmm. You know, he was taken out of what he was looking for two nights in a row. He's looking for a place to do this and, and get to that point that Gary's talking about and come back. Well, they have Narcan and never parties, too, where they have people that all come together and they shoot up together. And then they keep one person sober enough to call for help. And when they call for help, they all get narcan and then they do it again. Somebody else. Yeah, we, we, something has to be done. I'll tell you right now, my, uh, my son was, was walking with my grandkids. And he walked uh, the rail trail towards Gosstown, yeah. right? And he, you know the bridge just on yep. Kelly Street? Mm -hmm. The kids were saying, yeah, this is really dangerous right here. Some kids jump off and get hurt. And my son looked over and says, no, you see that needle over there? That's where the real danger is. I had some friends that were actually biking there. On, they actually live in Ware. And they were bicycling there um, as a family. And the mom and the daughter were ahead. And somebody came out and they were very frightened they came out and they chased them and they were very frightened luckily her older children were behind them boys that were you know tall boys um scared them off but it's not safe down there right now and then somebody else told me it happened in the trails right where shaw's used to be by my house it, it happened over there too right. so yeah. it's not it's not a safe city and no. and i i hate to have to keep saying it because i hate that it isn't a safe city you know i i want a safe place for my children i want some place that we can all enjoy i want to go to the parks with them it was just last summer i was play, playing pokemon go with them in the parks and there's no way that we could go down there and do that now right. there just isn't any way and it's shifted so quickly and i think some people are, are realizing what a great mayor ted gatsis was because he was able to keep sort of the floodgates closed and keep things in check somewhat and now the city is just it, it's just spiraling out of control so quickly i mean we have there's crime reported on a daily basis yeah. you know the homeless situation you walk out here you see it and yeah. it's impacting businesses significantly there's so much that we need to fix right now like we can't wait another two years no like i need to win this we need to have a board that supports me a school board that supports me and we need to turn the city around no i was i was uh for those people who don't know if you see people on the street asking for money do not give it to them no I had, had one I had just as I entered the building today. Mm -hmm. I had one last week. He came up to my car, and and he said. And they can be very aggressive. Yeah, we got someone line yeah. one, line one. Let's let's if it's Lisa. Uh, let's, let's hope I don't Lisa, hang up. Bring go ahead, go ahead, press it, press it. Hello, you're on rock paper hand grenades. Hey, how you doing tonight? Good, good. How are you? What's your name? I'm doing all right. 
Hey, uh, Gary, it was, uh, I saw you up at the gun show uh, in Concord on Saturday. Yeah. Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Uh, With my pearls. It, it was. <laughs> what's that? With my pearls on? Yes, sir. <laughs> that was the one that got caught with uh, Miss Susan. And, you know, I was the one that uh, shook your hand. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were the one. Sh there. She already had prolified. Yeah, you know, that's not a bad thing considering all the things that could happen up there. <laughs> we love Miss um, Susan. Yes, yes. Uh, Victoria, um, you know, I, I really like the way things are going with your campaign. Thank um, you. I was very uh, listening to you tonight. You, you're you're showing that you have the right direction to take this city forward. Uh, I understand that you know the current mayor did not inherit all of the problems here in the city, but she has shown a complete lack of leadership and I'm thrilled to death that you have, you know, you're willing to talk to people, you you have a plan, and hopefully with the backing of the citizens of the city, as you know, when you become mayor, we can turn the city around. I just want to say thank you and uh, I'm going to take off and off. Thank hey, you for that. Guys. Yeah, thanks for the call in. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. it. means a lot. Yeah, Miss, Su was, Miss Susan was putting pearls on a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, she does that. <laughs> and so for people that don't know, the Women's she, Defense League, their symbol has become a string of pearls. Yes, yeah. and she, they, yeah. she puts it on different people as they come yeah. around. I got out of it. On, I, I was up there the next day. I was you, up there oh, you went Sunday? Sunday? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Up yeah. Sunday. And Miss Susan is one of our beloved members of the Women's Defense League. Yes, yes, Miss Susan yeah. is pretty great. She She's pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> but, yeah, I was up there. I saw a lot of guns I couldn't afford. It's kind of sad. If you guys... If the viewers uh, take pity on me and want to... You want to do a GoFundMe for a new Go GoFundMe for a new firearm. <laughs> My wife will hate you, you but... <laughs> you, you cannot do that. You cannot can't. do that. So, so uh, well, uh, Just send me checks. Then. We found out the hard way. Um, this, this show is produced by the Wilson Hill Pistol Club, and the Wilson Hill Pistol Club does a number of fundraisers throughout the year, and uh, uh, we did attempt to do a GoFundMe. And they wouldn't let you? And... Uh, we started receiving donations, and then GoFundMe shut us down and refunded everybody because we were associated it, with firearms. Oh, isn't there a so is it an anti-Second Amendment um, uh, funding we, source? So uh, we well, all of them are except for one. There is one <laughs> Second Amendment friendly funding source. It's called Gun Dynamics. I think they're out of uh, Connecticut. Oh, okay. People have have got to study history. They have got to learn why the Second Amendment was important, is important, and will be important. And the fact that people think that it's, you know, I saw somebody, and I, I was on Fox News, and I saw a woman talking about, you don't need an assault rifle to go hunting. They don't know the terminology. They don't know what they're talking right. about. And people need to understand when they say that when they talk about military weapons, people, we had this conversation the other night at, when I was at a meet and greet. Uh, we're talking about legislation and how the title can be very different than what is actually in the bill, right? It right, happens all, all the, the time. time. Yeah. So people need to understand that military weapons can be handguns. The 1911 was invented to be a military weapon. Right? John Moses in, Browning invented that. That. Comes, down, that comes in a twenty two, a little twenty two caliber, right? Yes, it does. So uh, Ruger, um, SIG, they all make handguns yeah, that are used by the military. Right. right? It's evident. Folks are, 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 are working off of buzzwords, and they don't understand what they're talking about, uh, such as the... Was it two years ago? It was the legislature in, in, in Massachusetts uh, went to go and... Uh, uh, outlaw all assault rifles uh, or all ammunition types except for 22 but they didn't realize that the ar-15 is a 22 caliber right, bullet right. right so they they don't understand what they're talking about uh in any way they're talking about high capacity magazines they're talking about um uh, what is it that biden said the other day that uh uh, he said something about. He says always. Don't says, worry, he can't remember yeah, either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't paying that close of attention. But the the bottom line is is, is that they 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 call it an assault rifle. Okay, they, so you know, right. they, so we got to wrap this up. Okay. So I got to tell you a quick story because I don't think I've told you this. This is so fun. I don't fun. know if you have quick stories. I this is a quick one. All right. So at the at the Trump rally, right? right. Yep. There was a, a lady in front of me with one of those walkers that you can yep. sit in, mm -hmm. right? So she's sitting in, and it slid out from under. her. 
she fell on her butt. So me and uh, this guy I was with, you know, helped them helped her back up on into her uh, her uh, walker, and she sat down. I and I went over to her afterwards. I says, "Thank you very much." She goes, "Thank you." I says, "Yeah, this is the only time I can remember that my wife was okay with me picking up chicks." <laughs> Victoria, how do they get in touch with you? Victoria Sullivan from air.com. You can find us on Facebook as well. Um, if you go to the website, you can sign up to volunteer. You can make a donation. You can find out where we are for events. I will be at Glendy most of this weekend. Yes. So you should be able to find me. We'll be door knocking. Eddie Edwards is coming out to help me this weekend. Ooh. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's a good guy. So Victoria Sullivan from air.com. And uh, I look forward to being your mayor. Next Tuesday, get out and vote for my friend Victoria. Have a good night, folks.